Yeah, I think I'm a pretty good guy. Frank, are you good enough to get into heaven? Oh, sure. You know, someday you're going to stand before God. Oh, I'll do all right. Okay. Have you ever told a lie? Everybody does. So according to God's standard, you're a liar. Oh, what? No, I'm not. Well, you told a lie. The Ten Commandments say not to. Therefore, you're a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, I borrowed a few things. Did you give them back? No. Okay, so far you're a lying thief. Wait a minute, how can I defend myself against those kinds of standards? These are just two of God's commandments. There are more. Well, you make me sound really bad. Frank, compared to most people, you are a wonderful person. But the standard is not other people, it's God. Well, then nobody measures up. Right. That's why we need a Savior. Someone to pay the penalty of not measuring up for us. And that Savior is Jesus. So, standing before God without Jesus is not a good idea? I wouldn't try it. A message from Lifeline Productions. 1-800-523-8669. LifelinePro.com Good morning, this is Radio Good News. The goal of this program is to draw all people to the love of Jesus Christ. I want everyone to know and experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are key to a Holy Spirit-filled and successful Christian life. I will focus on God's love because God's love is wonderful. I'm John Thornton. You can write to me at Radio Good News, P.O. Box 1722, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57101. There's now a sponsorship opportunity available, so if that is of interest, drop me a note. I'll be reading from the Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, because the Bible is our guidebook for life. Let's begin today with Psalm number 40. My heart overflows with a goodly theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of men. Grace is poured out upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your glory and majesty. In your majesty, ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and to defend the right. Let your right hand teach you dread deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. Your royal scepter is a scepter of equity. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your people in your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people with all kinds of wealth. The princess is decked in her chamber with gold woven robes. In many colored robes she is led to the king. Behind her the virgins her companions follow. With joy and gladness they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. In the palace of ancestors you, O king, shall have sons, and you will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be celebrated in all generations. Therefore the peoples will praise you forever and ever. Those are God's words from Psalm 45. Our musical guest today is Amy Shreve. What wondrous love is this, O my soul? soul 
And that was Amy Shreve. We'll hear from her again at the end of the program. Stay tuned for that. Turn with me today to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. But the aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Some people have deviated from these and have turned to meaningless talk, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I am giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight having faith in a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have turned over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. Those are God's words from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, before I begin today's message, I must give a movie review. Recently, I took my wife and daughters to see The Nativity Story. It is awesome. I highly recommend that movie. I found it entertaining as well as moving. It is a fine movie. Take your family to the Nativity Story. Have a great time. Another movie I watched recently was the 2001 movie Delivering Milo with Bridget Fonda and Albert Finney. Both these actors are interesting. Albert Finney is in my all-time favorite Christmas movie, Scrooge, which is a musical. Bridget Fonda plays an expectant mom whose baby has other ideas in delivering Milo. There's a lot to think about there. Pre-existence, God's mysteries, the afterlife, the value of children, and God's plan in our lives. So if you get a chance to see that movie, Delivering Milo, check it out. Anyway, we're down to the end of 2006 and the start of a new year. How will it be for you? Today I want to start a series on the book of 1 Timothy. The key phrase in 1 Timothy chapter 1 is in verse 5. The aim of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Now there is a New Year's resolution. Will you commit your new year to love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith? The book of 1 Timothy is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to one of the young pastors in the early church. Timothy had answered God's call to go into ministry in part through the teachings of Paul. What comes to your mind? when you hear the word aim. 30 years ago when I was in high school, I was part of a small bore rifle shooting team. It was quite an interesting time to be in the basement of the high school and actually have time to shoot targets. As I remember those days, I have often thought about how different attending school in the 1970s was as compared to my daughter's experiences in school today. Recently, Axtell Park had a lockdown because some thugs were seen in a car brandishing weapons. The school did the right thing. But back when I was in school, we had rifles right in the school's basement. I digress. I was part of the rifle team. 
We would shoot at small targets with 22 rifles. We had three positions in shooting. Prone, that is lying flat on the floor on one's stomach. That's the easiest position as the rifle is well anchored with your elbows resting on the floor. I would score well shooting from the prone position. I consistently shot 90-some out of 100. I never shot a perfect 100, but I did shoot a 97. Nine bullseyes and a seven. That was the closest to perfect I ever scored. The next position was kneeling, where you would fold up your legs and get your arms in position and hold the rifle steady. I was able to be flexible back then. I could never get in a kneeling position today as I have artificial hips and artificial knees. But back as a teenager, the position of kneeling was pretty easy. I was not quite as solid as being prone, but kneeling was pretty good. I would consistently score 80-some out of 100 or so from the kneeling position. Shooting from the standing position is the most difficult. Your arms are not well supported, and aiming the rifle takes much more precision. I still did well enough to be on the rifle team, but my scores were usually in the 60s or 70s out of 100 from the standing position. Our rifle team never won too many matches, but we did get lots of practice at aiming and learning the value of concentration. Now, you may wonder, why in the world is John talking about shooting? Has John finally lost what is left of his senses? Maybe. But let's see if I can make a connection between shooting and being a successful Christian. For one aspect is essential for both. That is, aim. How's your aim? What are you aiming for this new year? 1 Timothy was written by Paul in about the year 65 A.D. Some Bible critics don't like the book, but the opening says, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So, if you hear critics knock the parts of the Bible, just tune them out and aim your listening somewhere worthy of your attention. Timothy was a very interesting man. He was the son of a Christian lady named Eunice. Timothy's grandmother was a God-fearing Jewish woman named Lois. Lois was probably converted to Christianity late in her life. For when Jesus came, the Messiah was here. Those righteous women raised up Timothy so that he knew the scriptures from an early age. We know that Timothy was a youthful reader of the scriptures. Paul calls Timothy his son in the faith. That's a great compliment. Today, too many young men are sons of the filth rather than sons of the faith. Timothy was assigned difficult tasks. This letter called 1 Timothy is a commission to one of those hard jobs. Timothy was instructed to remain in Ephesus so that he could instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrines. Timothy was to oppose those who occupied themselves with myths and endless genealogies, which promoted controversial speculations. That was a hard task for Timothy, but one to which God had equipped him. The aim of true Christian instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. That should be the aim of every Christian. Is your New Year's resolution to have love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith? Let's start with love. What is love? Have you ever seen the 1984 movie called Electric Dreams? Yes, I'm talking about yet another movie. Sorry, I like movies. In some ways, God gave me the perfect body for movies. Electric Dreams is a fun movie. In that movie, a young architect named Miles buys a new computer system. That computer system gets soaked in liquids and somehow it becomes self-aware, conscious, sentient, and alive, so to speak. Well, Miles has a beautiful new neighbor named Madeline. Madeline is a concert cellist played by Virginia Madsen. During the movie, there is a fun duet played between the computer named Edgar and Madeline on her cello upstairs. Well, anyway... In that movie, Miles and Madeline become romantically involved, and the computer asks, What is love? So let me ask you, what is love? Can you easily define love? Miles gives the computer, Edgar, a list of the consequences of love, like love is the most powerful thing, love can make you weak, love can make you sing, love can make you cry, to which Edgar finally ends up saying, That does not compute. So what is love? In 2 John 1, 6, we read, And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning. You must walk in it. We also have a bit longer version in 1 John 4, 17-21. Love has been perfected among us in this, 
that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears does not reach perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. So does this answer, what is love? Well, since Paul wrote to Timothy, maybe we should look at what Paul says about love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1-8, Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have all prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So is your New Year's resolution to have love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith? Next, Paul says that we should aim to have love that comes from a pure heart. Here it's kind of like aiming from the prone position. It's solid and reliable. But what is a pure heart? Well, Paul gives Timothy a list of things that are not from a pure heart. Paul tells us that the law is good when it is properly used. And the Old Testament law is there to point us all to the fact that we are sinners in need of a Savior. That is the proper use of the law. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient. The law is there to apply to the godless, the sinful, the unholy and profane, for those who kill, for fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. So, when people are involved in any of those sins, like sexual sinning, murder, supporting slavery, lying, or any other sin, then the law stands there telling us that we are wrong. The law works to point us each to the fact that we need Jesus Christ to forgive our sins. The law points us to Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Loving Jesus Christ is the only way to have a pure heart. Remember Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So get into the prone position. Set your sights on having a pure heart. Will your New Year's resolution be to to have love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith? Next, Paul tells us to love from a good conscience. This reminds me of shooting from the kneeling position. For only when I kneel in humble submission to God can I ever have a good conscience. For my conscience tells me that I have sinned in many and various ways. Right here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12-13, through 13, Paul writes, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Do you hear how Paul is humbling himself to his student Timothy? Paul admits that he has done things in his life that are really bad. Paul knows they are sin. Paul never tries to come off as better or more self-righteous than Timothy. If anything, Paul sets an example for us. He confesses his sins openly. Paul knows the truth that Jesus loves us and wants to forgive our every sin. So will you be strong enough? to admit you are weak? Will you humble yourself and seek the God of all creation who will forgive you and make you clean again? For you need grace. And remember, grace can be defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. For Jesus loves you so much that he went to the cross to pay for your sins. He paid for all the sins of the Apostle Paul. And Paul had been a violent murderer. If God can forgive Paul, then God can and will forgive you and me. But we must seek God's forgiveness and shun those sins in our lives. Jesus takes off that old dirty coat of sin and throws it away. Then Jesus will give you and me a bright new coat of white to cover you and keep you safe. So will you kneel down and set your sights on having love that leads to a good conscience? 
For only by receiving God's forgiveness will you ever have a good conscience. At the end of chapter 1, Paul gives Timothy a negative example of some people who failed to seek God's ways. Paul writes, I am giving you these instructions, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made earlier about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have turned over to Satan, so that they may learn not to blaspheme. That's a strong warning. By rejecting conscience, people are turned over to Satan. Wow, that's a powerful warning. Satan seeks only to kill, steal, destroy, and deceive. Do you want to be handed over to Satan? I don't. (laughs) Remember, Satan is a real entity that is far more evil and vile than you can imagine. But Satan is restrained by God. Do you really want God to release Satan to torment you? Will you listen to your conscience? Will you give up that sin which you know you're hanging on to? Will you give it up? Or does God need to give you over to Satan so that you can learn? That's scary. I pray that you'll give it up. So will you kneel down and set your sights on having love that leads to a good conscience? Will your New Year's resolution be to have love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith? Lastly, the key to all of Christian life is to have love in a sincere faith. As Hebrews 11.1 tells us, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This is kind of like shooting from the standing position. When you stand up in sincere faith, you may find it rather difficult at times. The trials and problems in life can knock you over more easily when you're standing up. Yes, it's harder to take aim at a righteous life when you're standing tall. But if you never stand up, there's no way you can walk forward and follow Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus used the illustration of building our houses on the rock. We can try to stand on rock or stand on sand. The sand will shift around and not give you any footing at all. But the rock will always be stable and strong. And we need to stand up for Jesus Christ. Will you stand up on the faith that you have in Jesus our Lord? Are you willing to stand up for truth when everyone else is off wandering away chasing empty controversies? Will you stand up for morality and honesty when everyone else seems to be excusing their own desires? Will you stand up and answer God's call to service, as did brave Timothy? Will you be a real Christian and stand up for Jesus? The important thing is to keep our aim focused and true with God's empowerment. And this is a truth that Paul vividly expressed. Paul knew the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which overflowed for him with the love and faith and sincereness that Jesus offers. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's you and I, my friend. But for that very reason, Jesus has given us all mercy so that we may be aiming at righteous life. In this, Jesus Christ displays the utmost patience. Jesus equips and empowers us who believe in him for eternal life. So how's your aim? Start with getting into the prone position and set your sights on having a pure heart. Next, kneel in prayer and set your sights on having love that leads to a good conscience. And lastly, stand up for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Prince of Peace. Do this and you'll always be on the winning team. So will your New Year's resolution be to have love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith? May you richly be blessed in 2007. I'm John Thornton. Thanks for listening to Radio Good News. I encourage you to seek out a church family where you can worship, be encouraged, and celebrate the love God has for you. For this area offers many fine Bible-believing and teaching churches of various denominations. May you richly know the blessings of the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come again. We'll finish today with Amy Shreve. Oh
人。